Hello, Spartan Nation. I have missed you since our last read aloud. Um, I hope you had a great um, last few days and that you are enjoying your remote learning. I also hope that you are learning something as well. So um, last time we talked about the third president of the United States, and that was, that's right, Thomas Jefferson. And his, um, his term was from 1801 to 1809. The first president of the United States was George Washington. His term was 1789 to 1797. John Adams was our second president. His term was from 1797 to 1801. Well, today we're going to work on the fourth president of the United States and his term. So I want you to think about that, and at the end of the read aloud, I will reveal that unless you already know it. We've also worked on Alabama. The capital is Montgomery. That's right. We've worked on Alaska, and the capital is Juneau. That's right. Good job. And we've worked on the uh, the state of Arizona, and the capital is Phoenix. That is correct. So today, alphabetically, our fourth, our fourth uh, state alphabetically is Arkansas. And I want you to think about what the capital of Arkansas is. So um, I want to give a shout out to Lily and Emily Stewart because they have been memorizing these things as well. So today we're going to start with uh, nursery rhymes. And I've picked a few nursery rhymes for you, uh, a few of my favorites. And remember, um, go outside and jump some rope and put the nursery rhymes to music, and you'll have great jump rope rhymes. All right, the first one I'm going to read is Peas Porridge, and I bet you played this as a, ch as a younger child. Peas Porridge hot, peas porridge cold, peas porridge in the pot nine days old. Some like it hot, some like it cold. Some like it in the pot nine days old. And here's a picture of the peas porridge. Okay. And this one I bet everyone has uh, uh, put to music as well, maybe played a game. It's called Ring Around a Roses. Ring around a roses, a pocket full of posies. Tisha, tisha, we all fall down. You may have heard of... Uh, Ring around the rosies, pocket full of posies, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. So this is just a different um, variation of that. And so those are our two nursery rhymes for the day. I'll do some more next time. And I've got a special book because we've got a special holiday coming up, Easter. And this is called Cranberry Easter by Wendy and Harry Devlin. And they have done a whole series of books about the different holidays and so when you start reading them you'll come along uh, come across the same characters and at the end of the stories there is usually a recipe so since you're at home you might be able to create these recipes with your parents and email me and let me know how good they are I know that I have made a couple of the recipes I don't know if I've ever made this one so when we get to the back of the book I'll look so remember to email me Hamer, SW, at SESK12.org if you want to uh, give me some suggestions of read-alouds. I hope that you enjoyed Go Dog Go last time because that's one of my favorites, or in my daughter and my husband's favorite. And um, all of the Cranberry books are part of my favorites. Cranberry Easter by Wendy and Harry Devlin. It was um, actually written in 1990. Most of the Cranberry books were written in the 70s. And the dedication page to Alexandra Wendy Devlin. Look, spring is here. Mr. Whisker stood at the door of Seth's general store with a mass of pussy willows in his arms. I've come to plan your Easter egg hunt, Seth, he said. You dye the eggs this year and I'll play the Easter bunny. Seth frowned. No, no Easter egg hunt this year. I'm going to sell the store and head south. I'll be gone by Easter time. Sell the store? Mr. Whiskers could not believe his ears. Suffering codfish, Seth. Who will 
Who is going to sell me night shirts and long underwear? Who am I going to beat at checkers on Saturday nights? It won't be me, Seth shook his head. Nobody really needs me. Nobody cares. I'm all alone in this big place. I'm ready to say goodbye to Cranberry Port. This had been a long, lonely winter for Seth. His wife had died in late summer, and he missed the sound of a voice at night. Mr. Whiskers wished he could cheer him, but he couldn't think of a thing to say. And I'm tired of all the gray skies, said Seth. He waved goodbye to Mr. Whiskers, banged the door shut, and went off to take a nap in the back of the store. Mr. Whiskers stopped at Grandmother and Maggie's house to share his news. I'm upset too, said Grandmother, bustling about, making hot chocolate. My friends Nan and Grandma Gates have both decided they can't last another snowbound winter alone on their farms. They need rooms in town, but there are none to be found. I have an idea, Grandmother, Maggie cried. The rooms over Seth's general store used to be a hotel. Wouldn't they be just right for your friends? Mr. Whiskers looked at Maggie in wonder. You've got it, Maggie, he boomed. They're, they are filled with old furniture. We'll get Seth to clear them out. Ma Grandmother gave Maggie a delighted smile. I'll start with some calls, she said, and hurried down the hall to the phone. We don't really use phones like that anymore, do we? Who is... Who are the main characters so far in the story? Where does it take place? And when does it take place? In the past, present, or future? Is it in, uh, which season is it in? And what time of day? Overjoyed, Mr. Whiskers hastened back to Seth's general store. But Seth, Seth turned his back on the whole idea. Never, he grumbled. I'm much too tired to clean up all those rooms. Mr. Whiskers wouldn't give up. Suffering codfish, Seth. Those old folks are all alone. Somebody's got to help. They need you. He paced back and forth. Well, said Seth, it's a jumble upstairs, but maybe we can take a look. What is the problem so far in the story? I wonder if there'll be a solution. From then on, Mr. Whiskers took charge. After the sale of extra chairs and tables, there was enough money to paint for paint and brushes. Even the mayor and the sheriff joined in scrubbing, painting, and polishing. Maggie and her friends cleaned windows, and Grandmother sewed curtains. The rooms, bright and clean, were a joyous surprise when Mr. Whiskers, Maggie, and Grandmother showed them to the new residents. Grandma Gates was especially pleased. I'll never have to go out in the storm for groceries again, she said with great cheer. Nan looked out the window on the town square. Oh, Seth, we can watch the Easter egg hunt from here, she said. Seth threw up his hands. You win, he told Mr. Whiskers. I guess I'll have to stay in Cranberry Port a little longer. Maggie, tell the children at school the Easter egg hunt is on for sure. The trees began to bud, and soon there was a magical green mist all over the land. I think you've probably seen that magical green mist around Memphis lately. At the general store, Seth found himself listening now and then for bustling sounds from overhead. On Easter Eve, Grandma Gates helped Seth dye the egg. Easter dawned with a brilliant sun in Cranberry Port. Early in the day, Seth and Mr. Whiskers began to hide eggs of every hue, orange, yellow, violet, behind bushes and trees and under rocks in the village green. Do you know the visible spectrum? You may have heard that from your science teacher. Um, a mnemonic device would be Roy G. Biv. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Also, those are our um, 
primary and secondary colors. And what colors do you get when you mix primary and secondary colors? I'll ask you at the end. I bet Miss Shirley has taught you that. Seth felt a small stir of happiness at being part of this Easter celebration. Look at the blue skies today, he said thoughtfully to Mr. Whiskers. At noon, a crowd of happy, noisy children began to gather in the center of the village. Mr. Whiskers rounded them up and readied them for the hunt. He called, One, two, three, go! The Easter egg hunt was on. Children darted among rocks and bushes in search of eggs. They knew that one prize, a large chocolate egg wrapped in gold, awaited the child who found the most. When nearly all the eggs had been discovered, Seth searched out Mr. Whiskers and whispered a message in his ear. Mr. Whiskers' eyes rolled. He groaned. You promised, said Seth, as he steered his friend toward the store. Do you remember what Mr. Whiskers promised Seth at the beginning of the story? A few moments later, a big, fat Easter bunny hopped across the square. The shouting children swarmed all around. What is it? asked a small boy, pulling on the bunny's tail. Suffering codfish. I'm the Easter bunny, Mr. Whisker shouted. Can't you see? Over his head, he held a giant basket with chocolate eggs wrapped in gold. Today there are prizes for everyone, Seth announced. The children cheered. Even the youngest was given a golden prize to take home. This is, was one of the best Easter egg hunts ever, one of the children shouted to Seth as they waved goodbye. Seth beamed. See you next year, he called. Next year? Did I hear that right? Mr. Whiskers wheeled around and grinned at Grandmother. Seth is here to stay. He started to hop back to dress for Grandmother's dinner, but then he stopped. Maggie was telling Seth what they could be having for their Easter feast. There'll be roast lamb, new potatoes, mint jelly, and cranberry cobbler, she said. Hooray, shouted Mr. Whiskers. Oh, that's just for us, said Grandmother, winking at Seth. For you, there's a bunch of carrots back at the rabbit hutch. What do you normally have for Christmas, uh, for Easter dinner? And I wonder which one of those recipes might be at the end of this book. And is Easter really about Easter bunnies? Mr. Whiskers began to smile. You couldn't fool him. There would always be a place at Grandmother's table for him on holidays, and a place for Seth, too. He knew friends always take care of one another. That's the way of cranberry port on holidays and the whole year round. What did you think the recipe was going to be? Well, it's cranberry cobbler. It talks about the filling, the crust, and everything. Yummy, yummy, yummy. I will um, take a picture of this page. And um, I will email it to anybody that wants the recipe. So just email me, remember, Hamer, S-W-S-E-S-K-12.org. All right, or your parents can Facebook me and ask me for the recipe. Well, last time I read chapters 5 and 6, so I'm going to read chapters, I know 7, and if I have time, I'll read chapter 8 as well, of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Remember last time, all four siblings got into Narnia, and um, at first, um, Edmund was acting like, eh, I've never been here, and then he uh, let it out that he really had been there. So let's see what happens next. They're following a robin. Chapter 7, A Day with the Beavers. While the two boys were whispering behind both, both the girls suddenly cried, Oh, and stopped. 
the robin, cried Lucy, the robin, it's flown away. And so it had, right out of sight. And now what are we to do? said Edmund, giving Peter a look, which was as much as to say, what did I tell you? Shh, look, said Susan. What, said Peter, there's something moving among the trees over there to the left. They all stared as hard as they could, and no one felt very comfortable. There it goes again, said Susan presently. I saw it that time too, said Peter. It's still there. It's just gone behind that big tree. What is it? asked Lucy, trying very hard not to sound nervous. Would you be nervous? Are you thinking about who the main characters are? When it takes place, where it takes place, and if there is a problem, and um, I wonder if what the solution's going to be. Whatever it is, said Peter, it's dodging us. It's something that doesn't want to be seen. Let's go home, said Susan. And then, though nobody said it aloud, everyone suddenly realized the same fact that Edmund had whispered to Peter at the end of the last chapter. They were lost. What's it like, said Lucy. Mm, it's, it's a kind of animal, said Susan. And, and then, look, look, quick, there it is. They all saw it this time a whiskered furry face which had looked at them from behind a tree. But this time, it didn't immediately draw back. Instead, the animal put its paw against its mouth, just as humans put their finger to their lip when they are signaling to you to be quiet. Then it disappeared again. The children all stood holding their breath. A moment later, the stranger came out from behind the tree, glanced all round as if it were afraid someone was watching and said, hush, and made signs for them to join them in the thicker bit of the wood where it was standing, and then once more disappeared. I know what it is, said Peter. It's a beaver. I saw the tail. It wants us to go to it, said Susan, and it is warning us not to make a noise. I know, said Peter. The question is, are we to go to it or not? What do you think, Lou? I think it's a nice beaver, said Lucy. Yes, but how do we know, said Edmund. Shan't we have a risk it, said Susan. I mean, it's no good just standing here. I, I feel I want some dinner. At this moment, the beaver again popped its head out from behind the tree and beckoned earnestly for them. Come on, said Peter. Let's give it a try. All keep close together. We ought to be a match for one beaver if it turns out to be an enemy. So the children all got close together and walked up to the tree and in behind it, and there, sure enough, they found the beaver. But it still drew back, saying to them in a hoarse, throaty whisper, Further in! Come further in! Right in here! We're not safe in the open! Only when it had led them into the dark spot where four trees grew so close together that their boughs met and oops, my hands are dry. The brown earth and pine needles could be seen underfoot because no snow had been able to fall there that it began to talk to them. So here's a picture you can see of the beaver way back in the wood. And then here it is motioning for them to come along. Are you the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve, it said. We are some of them, said Peter. Shoo, shh, said the beaver. Not so loud, please. We're not safe even here. Why? Who are you afraid of, said Peter? There's no one here but ourselves. There are the trees, said the beaver. They're always listening. Most of them are on our side, but there are trees that would betray us for her. You know who I mean. And it nodded its head several times. If it comes to talking about sides, said Edmund, how do we know your friend? 
not meaning to be rude, Mr. Beaver, added Peter, but you see we're strangers. Quite right, quite right, said the beaver. Here's my token. With these, these words, it held up to them a little white object. They all looked at it in surprise till suddenly Lucy said, Oh, of course, it's my handkerchief, the one I gave poor Mr. Tumnus. That's right, said the beaver. Poor fella. He got wind of their rest before it actually happened and handed it over to me. He said that if anything happened to him, I must meet you here and take you on to... Here the, bo the beaver's voice sank into silence and it gave one or two mysterious nods then signaling the children to stand as close around as they possibly could so that their faces were actually tick tickled by its whiskers, it added in a low voice, They say uh, Aslan is on the move, perhaps has already landed. Hmm, I wonder who Aslan is. And now a very curious thing happened. None of the children knew who Aslan was any more than you do. But the moment the beaver had spoken these words, everyone felt quite different. Perhaps it has sometimes happened to you in a dream that someone says something which you don't understand, but in the dream it feels as if it had some enormous meaning, either a terrifying one which turns the whole dream into a nightmare, or else a lovely meaning too lovely to put into words which makes the dream so beautiful that you remember it all your life and are always wishing you could get into the dream again. It was like that now. At the name of Aslan, each one of the children felt something jump inside. Edmund felt a sensation of mysterious horror. Peter felt suddenly brave and adventurous. Susan felt as if some delicious smell or some delightful strain of music had just floated by her. And Lucy got the feeling you have when you wake up in the morning and realize it is the beginning of the holidays or the beginning of summer. And and what about Mr. Tumnus? said Lucy. Where is he? Shh, 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 said the beaver. Not here. I must bring you where we can have a real talk and also dinner. No one except Edmund felt any difficulty about trusting the beaver now and everyone, including Edmund, was very glad to hear the word dinner. They, therefore, all hurried along behind their new friend, who led them at a surprisingly quick pace, and always in the thickest part of the forest. For over an hour, everyone was feeling very tired and very hungry, when suddenly the trees began to get thinner in front of them, and the ground to fall steeply downhill. A minute later, they came out under the open sky, the sun was still shining, and found themselves looking down on a fine sight. They were standing on the edge of a steep, narrow valley, at the bottom of which ran, at least it would have been running if it hadn't been frozen, a fairly large river. Just below them, a dam had been built across the river, and when they saw it, Everyone suddenly remembered that, of course, beavers are always making dams and felt quite sure that Mr. Beaver had made this one. They also noticed that, they, that he now had a sort of modest expression on his face, the sort of look people have when you're visiting a garden they've made or reading a story they've written. So it was only common politeness when Susan said, What a lovely dam! And Mr. Beaver didn't say, Hush, this time, merely, Merely a trifle, merely a trifle, and it, and it, it really isn't finished. Above the dam, there was what ought to have been a deep pool, but was now, of course, a level floor of dark green ice. And below the dam, much lower down, more was more ice. But instead of being smooth, this was all frozen into foamy and wavy shapes in which the water had been rushing along at the very moment when the frost came, and where the water had been trickling over and spurting through the dam, there were now gl glittering walls of icicles, 
as if the side of the dam had been covered all over with flowers and wreaths and festoons of the purest sugar. And out in the middle, and partly on top of the dam, was a funny little house shaped rather like an enormous beehive, and from a hole in the roof, smoke was coming up, so that when you saw it, especially if you were hungry, you at once thought of cooking and became hungrier than you were before. That was what the others chiefly noticed. But Edmund noticed something else. A little lower down the river, there was another small river, which came down another small valley to join it. And looking up that valley, Edmund could see two small hills, and it was almost sure they were the two hills which the white witch had pointed out to him when they parted from when he parted from her at the lamp post the other day and then between them he thought must be her palace only a mile off or less and he thought about turkish delight and about being king and i wonder how peter would like that he asked himself and horrible ideas came into his head here we are said mr beaver and it looks as if Mrs. Beaver is expecting us. I'll lead the way in, but be careful, don't slip. The top of the dam was wide enough to walk on, though not for humans a very nice place to walk because it was covered with ice, and though the frozen pool was level with it on one side, there was a nasty drop to the lower river on the other. Along this route, Mr. Beaver led them in single file right out to the middle where they could look a long way up the river and a long way down it. And when they had reached the middle, they were at the door of the house. Here we are, Mrs. Beaver, said Mr. Beaver. I found them. Here are the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. And they all went in. The first thing Lucy noticed as she went in was a burring sound, and the first thing she saw was a kind-looking old, old she-beaver sitting in the corner with red in her mouth, working busily at her sewing machine, and it was from it that the sound came. And here's a picture of them going into the beaver's home. She stopped her work and got up as soon as the children came in. So you've come at last, she said, holding out both her wrinkled old paws. At last, to think that, that ever I should live to see this day. The potatoes are on boiling and the kettle's singing, and I dare say, Mr. Beaver, you'll get us some fish. That I will, said Mr. Beaver, and he went out of the house. Peter went with him, and across the ice of the deep pool, to where he had a little hole in the ice, which he kept open every day with a hatchet. They took a pail with them. Mr. Beaver sat down quietly at the edge of the hole. He didn't seem to mind it being very so chilly. Looked hard into it, then suddenly shot his paw, and before you could say Jack Robinson, he whisked out a beautiful trout. Then he did it again, until they had a fine catch of fish. Meanwhile, the girls were helping Mrs. Beaver to fill the kettle and lay the table and cut the bread and put the plates in the oven to heat and draw a huge jug of beer for Mr. Beaver from a barrel which stood in the corner of the house and to put on a frying pan and get the dripping hot. Lucy thought the beavers had a very snug little home, though it was not at all like Mr. Tumnus's cave. There were no books or pictures, and instead of beds, there were bunks, like on board ship, built into the wall. And there were hams and strings of onions hanging from the roof, and against the walls were gum boots and oil skins and hatchets and pairs of shears and spades and trowels and things for carrying mortar in and fishing rods and fishing nets and sacks. And the cloth on the table, though very clean, was very rough. So, uh, let's go back. Do you know what gum boots are and oil skins? Well, gum boots are like galoshes or rain boots, and oil skins are like um, raincoats. Just as the frying pan was nicely hissing, Peter and Mr. Beaver came in with the fish, which Mr. Beaver had already opened with his knife and cleaned out in the open air. 
You can think how good the new caught fish smelled while they were frying and how the hungry children longed for them to be done and how very much hungrier still they had become before Mrs. Beaver said, Now we're nearly ready. Susan drained the potatoes and then put them all back in the empty pot to dry on the side of the range while Lucy was helping Miss, Mrs. Beaver to dish up the trout so that in a very few minutes, everyone was drawing up their stools. It was all three-legged stools in the Beaver's house except for Mrs. Beaver's own special rocking chair beside the fire and preparing to enjoy themselves there was a jug of creamy milk for the children. Mr. Beaver stuck the beer. And a great big lump of deep yellow butter in the middle of the table from which everyone took as much as he wanted to go with his potatoes. And all the children thought, and I agree with them, that there's nothing to beat good freshwater fish. If you eat it when it has been alive half an hour ago and has come out of the pan half a minute ago. And when they had finished the fish, Mrs. Beaver brought unexpectedly out of the oven a great and gloriously sticky marmalade roll, steaming hot, and at the same time moved the kettle onto the fire so that when they had finished the marmalade roll, the tea was made and ready to be poured out. And when each person had got his or her cup of tea, each person shoved back his or her stool so as to be able to lean against the wall and have a long sigh of contentment. Here's a picture of the dinner table. And now, said Mr. Beaver, pushing away his empty beer mug and pulling his cup of tea toward him, if you'll just wait till I've got my pipe lit up and going nicely, why, now we can get to the business. It's snowing again, he added, cocking his eye out the window. That's all the better because it means we shan't have any visitors, and if anyone should have been trying to follow us, why, he won't find any tracks. Well, that is the chat. That's the end of chapter seven. I'm going to stop now, and I will read eight next time. And uh, let's go back to our trivia. Our trivia was who. Uh, was the fourth president of the United States. It was James Madison, and his term was from 1809 to 1817. And uh, Arkansas was our fourth state that we were talking about in alphabetical order, and its capital is Little Rock. So I hope that you memorize those things. Email me if you have a special read-aloud book that you want me to read aloud, and I will continue reading The Lion, the Witch, and Wardrobe till we finish. And I may go on to the next, um, I may go next volume in the Chronicles of Narnia. See you next time.